Hi, thanks for joining me today on the very first conversation discussion on the channel. And the whole reason why this topic came up to begin with is because I want to put out more board game videos. I want to film more B-roll. I want to play more games. And as I'm tweaking different steps of that process, I realize that there's always one step, one bottleneck that is slowing me down. And that is the rule book. Now, let me premise all this with a few different things. In no way, shape or form am I attacking a specific game. But in order for me to really answer this question and clarify this argument as much as possible, I feel like it's important to bring up games that way you can see very specific examples of what I'm talking about. Now, sadly, the whole point of this conversation we're having is to distill down board game rule books as much as possible to give future teachers, learners, designers kind of like a template to follow so more people are inclined to learn their game. We want to enjoy your game. We want to have fun playing it. We love how your game looks. We're excited to play it. We love all the features about it. We're excited to learn about all the unique aspects of it. So the goal is to lower that learning curve so more and more people can enjoy the time and effort that you and your team put into making this amazing game. Now with that said, there are a ton of different games. Resource management games, war games, strategy games, card games, card drafting games. Now on top of that, the audience for rule books, it's different. Sometimes you have people that are learning the game for the first time. Sometimes you have people referencing the game for a quick rules explanation, or sometimes there's a specific scenario that they're looking to, to answer. Sometimes these rule books are used to market the game. Everyone learns differently and everyone teaches differently. All to say that it is a very complicated gray area, which makes it that much more fun and exciting to discuss. Leading up to the big question of the day, how do you write a good board game rule book? So let's start off first with the setup. I feel like this is a great way to ease into our conversation because this is an area where most people are agreeing and are in a general consensus about. So first it serves as a double check. So you can see whether or not you received every single component that was supposed to be included with the game. Second, it lets you organize components for both starting play and for when you inventory the game later on. Now thirdly, it is an oversight and a reference to every component in the game. Now the Grim Forest and Cerebria do that exceptionally well. All the location boards are listed, everything is labeled, numbered, it's clear, and the cards, they include the front and the back. Let me say it again, the front and the back. If you only have one deck of cards in your game, that's totally fine. It doesn't matter whether or not you show the front or back because it's only one set. So if you have multiple types of cards, you have to include the back so we can separate them easier. Most of the time they come shrink wrapped and they're probably not organized. So it saves us a lot of time if you just show us what the back looks like and what the front looks like. For example, if you have like power cards and hero cards and victory cards, those are three separate types of cards. It makes it easier for us if you include the back so we're able to separate them way faster. Miniatures, those should also be labeled and kind of blown up so it's easy for us to see in detail what they look like, especially if your miniatures start to look kind of similar. For example, the firebenders and waterbenders in Legend of Korra, those elements, it's hard to differentiate, especially if they come unpainted. So it's easier for us to see and differentiate which miniature is which if that mini in the rule book is included at a bigger scale, labeled very clearly. It should also be positioned so that way you see very distinct characteristics so you know exactly which one is which. Now secondly, list what goes on the table and what goes in what spot. There shouldn't be any kind of how to play concepts here. Don't explain anything yet. Just keep it simple. Here's the board. Here's what you put on the board. Here's what you put next to the board. If the game has a different setup for like the base game and for like player setup, that's totally fine to keep them separate. You can just list whatever goes on the main board and whatever goes in front of the player. Now in Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea, they have a super nice concise list showing you exactly what goes on the table and what goes in front of the player. Place these action tokens here, deal a spell card to each player. Everything's very streamlined and very straightforward. Next to the written game setup, they have a diagram of exactly what's been written. So they have the base game shown, and instead of just showing three generic factions, they actually show the factions that you use in the game. So instead of just orcs, orcs, and orcs, they show orcs, dwarves, and then elves, and then they blow up the player board and show each component that you should have in front of you. I think that's a very good and clear example of how the component list should look like. Now, any kind of variance of the game or expansions, those should still be separated from the main list, because if you start introducing more ideas that shouldn't be there, it's just gonna cause confusion. So better to separate any kind of expansion and variants to the end, keep the main list of components in the beginning. If cards should be shuffled or not shuffled, please state it because then we won't know. Like for example, if you have event cards, number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I would assume those go in order. I, mean, I didn't know we were supposed to shuffle those cards. So better to just take a couple words and say, shuffle this event deck, put it in front of you or 
don't shuffle these set of cards and put it to the side for now. If you have a unique tower or super cool 3D model building, show us a diagram of how to put it together in case we forgot. Like for example, in Everdell, you have the Evertree. They put a little diagram to show you step by step how to put together the Evertree. Now lastly, you want to include the number of components that are available in the game, but most rulebooks in general do a really good job of doing that, so kudos to you guys. So to summarize the rulebook setup. So first off, list all the components, list the number of components that are available, make sure it's only for the base game, with a clear labeled picture of each and every component, making sure that you also blow up the miniatures so we see what each miniature looks like and we can compare with the actual miniature provided and also show us the front and the back of cards. And then when describing the setup, don't include any kind of how to play or any kind of strategy. Just put, just tell us what goes on the table, what goes in front of each player. Do tell us whether or not we should or should not shuffle cards. And also include a diagram or like a step-by-step -step of how to put different models together if you have like buildings or trees or some kind of 3D structure that needs to be assembled for the game. How to play. This is where the meat and substance of what today's argument is all about. So after going through a, a ton of all of these rule books and Reddit and social media in general and going through all the tutorials I've made, I still personally stand by one major point that I think every rule book can be distilled down to. And that is what do I do on my turn and how does the game end? Even having one designated summary section that answers these questions for me, it would have saved a lot of frustration. It would have saved a lot of headaches. It would have steered me towards some games instead of away from them. When you are writing the how to play section, two writers actually brought up two very, very good points. Also, if you want to link to that discussion, I'll link it down below. The one King Prawn mentioned that if your writing already makes sense without the use of pictures, it's only going to be that much better when you do include pictures. That was such a good point. And that is so true. You know, the writing should definitely be emphasized way more and arguably before even any kind of pictures are included to begin with. And to add to that, Bro Dog Millionaire One brought up another good point, which was it's not just about clear and coherent writing, but it's also about organizing information. Organizing information and delivering the rules in a clear, concise order. Clear and organized writing, writing well without even including pictures, I would agree massively with both of them. Those are two very, very good points. Big thanks to Bro Dog Millionaire One, the Redditors, and of course everyone involved in this discussion. I'm bringing up a lot of your points as we go, but Bro Dog Millionaire One especially used a lot of your points as a basis for some stuff that we're going to talk about right now. Start with a table of contents. There needs to be nothing creative here. The game will still be played and will still be enjoyed if you just include a basic one through four section title. For example, in the Legend of Korra, the phases are, are labeled, you know, keep focused, play hard, check kits, and stay sharp. Going into the game, you don't know which one's in which order, but if you just made it phase one, two, three, four, I think it would have been a lot easier for us to kind of learn faster. In the table of contents, you also want to include page numbers, whether it's a section number or whether it is a specific page, make sure you include page numbers for all of that. For example, in the Battle of Alchemist, you have the table of contents with all the different sections, but without a page number, it kind of defeats the purpose because we still have to flip through the pages to find out where those sections are. But what is nice though, is that they did break it down step-by-step step where each section is happening. And even for the actions, there are still subheadings that are included. So that's great. Now, when you're doing a table of contents, you're also kind of organizing and making an outline for your whole rule book. Essentially, you're writing a story, right? And the players are the ones that are diving into the world that you made. So tell them how it starts, tell them how to get involved in the story, and then tell them how it finishes. Now, establishing a table of contents will also address the types of players that are going to your game. If players are new to the game, they get to see at least the general overview and flow of how the game is organized. If you're a returning player, you can quickly look up section titles to see what you're looking for. People looking to back your game on Kickstarter or just interested in gameplay in general, here's a quick outline for them to see how the game flows. Lords of Hellas actually, I think does this really well. First page, you turn it and you see all the sections that are bolded. They have all the page numbers. They have subheadings, concepts that go underneath each title are indented. If you want a specific reference and you want to go back to like blessings or artifacts, they're all listed here. So you can refer to them right away. So table of contents, straightforward titles, number everything, and even better if you indent these subheadings. Now after the table of contents is an introduction and an objective. I think the term overview here is used quite often. And to be honest, I think it should be separated from an introduction and objective. And let me explain why. An introduction is a premise to your story. 
what's the whole game about? What's the theme behind your story? Most multiplayer games keeps this relatively short and that's fine because it introduces a quick theme. If you do plan to have a longer instruction, I think it makes more sense if your board game is more campaign driven like Tainted Grail or Kingdom Death or Seventh Continent. All of those makes more sense if you have a longer introduction. But for like a multiplayer game, you kind of have to ask yourself like how often are you going to sit there and read the story to everybody? Depends on your group, all right? Depends on what you guys like. Depends on how everyone plays. For my own personal group, a quick one to two liner is enough for them to get started because then they just want to get started playing the game. So in more casual games, I think a short introduction would suffice. And then we lead on to the objective. The objective answers the question, what's the whole point of the game? Sky Tier and Barker's Row, I think do a very good job of summarizing what the objective should be. For example, in Sky Tier, the primary goal of Sky Tier is to destroy the enemy nexus. Boom, super simple very short and then right after it lists the victory conditions or what happens in a draw i love that in barker's row you are a carnival backer trying to attract root meeples to your grandstands by playing the most fantastic attractions using barker cards from a shared pool first player to fill all the grandstand seats wins that's it rising sun i think does a great job at differentiating the differences between the introduction and the objective. So for the intro, you know, you're a shogun and you're leading these clans. And then in the objective, they say how many players this is for. It answers what's the point of the game, which is players compete to lead their clans to victory by accumulating victory points over the course of seasons. And then right after they say, this is how you get those victory points. Okay, so table contents, intro, objective. We talked about a component list. We talked about the main board setup, player setup, if you have that too. Now let's move on to an overview. Wingspan, I would say, does a section justice because they establish time and they establish order. So to start off by saying that this game is played over four rounds, and then for each round, everyone's going to take turns going clockwise until every player has used up all their action cubes. That establishes time. Now, right after that, they establish kind of like this bird's eye view, pun intended, of what happens on your turn, and that's order. If it's one thing to take away from this entire video, it is this. Give players turn structure and put things in order. There's always a way to organize any kind of actions explained in your game. For example, in Wingspan, you have four available actions. You don't have to play a bird first though and then gain food and then lay eggs. You can do that out of order. But what's nice about the rulebook is that it'll tell you like these are the actions you have available. You can then take one of those actions. And to do so, here's how you do it step by step. Step one, choose the habitat. Step two, move your action cube. Step three, when the action cube reaches our far left, then your turn's over. Now you can take one of these actions that are listed out of the four. Now first you're going to choose a habitat on your player map, and then you place an action cube to the leftmost exposed slot and then gain that benefit. Then you move that action cube from right to left, and it includes a condition chronologically as you're moving the action cube from right to left. Activate bird powers that are labeled when activated. So see how they include this condition as you're coming across it when you are reading the directions. And right after, it also addresses a very common question, a FAQ, so to say. Each power is optional. Why? Because probably after all the people that are playtested, maybe they asked very often, do we have to activate this power? And then lastly, it finishes with move your action cube to the very far left. And when you leave it there, your turn is over. So see how they tell you what you can do on your turn. If you want to perform any of those actions, here's how you go about doing them. And as they're explaining the process, they're also addressing conditions that are met in that order. And they're also answering a very common question that was probably asked by including it right then and there. That's so important because you are piecing together information for us. And it's not related to strategy at all. It's just covering what we need to know in order to play the game properly. So recapping the overview section as a whole, establish time and order. Tell us how many rounds it is. Is it five rounds or is it 12 rounds? How does turn order work? Do I take three actions all at once or do I take one action and then have the other player take another action? How does it work? Tell us the order and piece together information as it comes up. You do this first and then this and then this. If you are meeting this condition, this happens. Oh, by the way, if you're probably thinking this, let me address that by putting an asterisk and saying this is actually optional. So an overview is just a brief, concise section of what players will be doing on their turn. I also like how they included round structure and game end scoring right after the turn structure. So putting this all together, it provides a very nice, clean overview of the game. Now, after an overview comes gameplay. Each concept needs to serve as context for the next. Now, even better, make sure they're structured around a common category like turn sequence, round structure, a specific action, the type of cards. It needs to be connected enough so it serves as an anchor point when you are 
explaining the rest of the rules. I can't stress this enough. I can't highlight this point enough that Brodog mentioned. Now here is a perfect example of what we mean by this. In Lords of Hellas, one of the actions that you have available to you is to send a priest to pray. So praying is the, the action in this game. But then in the very first line, it says, players can send a priest from their priest pool. Note, players start without any priest to any chosen monument. The rest of the description kind of goes on and doesn't tell you how to get priest to your priest pool. So then you look up priest pool, and then it says, when a player receives a priest, he, she places them in the priest pool. Only priests that have been placed in the priest pool are counted as player property, e.g. for a quest. So that still doesn't tell us the first question, which is how do we get priests in the first place? But then later you find out as you start piecing things together, you find out that you get them by building temples and then by building monuments. So I feel like information like that should be pieced together for us so we're not kind of looking around and everything related to priests and prayer should be under one section. So this is a prime example of how it can invite confusion and how it may lead us to more investigation for finding the solutions for whatever we're looking for. You can avoid this by just including page numbers of where we can find answers to those questions. Like a quick reference, here's page nine, here's how you would get more priests. And it'd be even better if you put them close together. So we're not constantly hunting around the rulebook. And if you want to link it all together, we could make prey the last action of the regular actions and then building a monument and building a temple, the first of the special actions. So that way they're all close together and you'll see them back to back. So to reiterate, it helps a lot when you have concepts that serve as context for the next upcoming rule. And you also want to heavily, heavily reference everything in the game. If you have something related to building priests and building priest monuments, page number, page number, page number. So different terms, different phrases, different actions, I think all of those should be referenced as well. Now the second big point on how to make a better how to play rulebook section, you have to keep in mind the amount of information that you're giving people and it's easier to just chunk information together instead of just listing everything at once. If your game is more complicated, that's fine. Just break it down as you go or summarize each section as you go. Try to present only what is necessary and cut the fat. You wanna be able to differentiate a how to play versus a reference section. For example, in Legend of Korra, you have phase one and you have phase two, but then right after that, instead of going to phase three, it lists like all of the status conditions for every single individual action that I think can easily be put in a reference section. So like, there's no way that we're gonna memorize one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 different status symbols all at once. I think realistically, we just have to put in perspective like, okay, we're gonna be teaching people who in turn will be passing this information onto other people. So what's the best way for us to chunk information together and give them what they need to know and a better way for them to understand and memorize those rules quickly instead of having like a list of things that they don't need to remember right then and there. But then this leads to another point that I think should be addressed also in rule books and that is sometimes you have games that are way more complicated and in those games you have a list of different kind of if statements that you have to address as you're playing the game or as you're learning the rule book. For example, in Vindication, one of the actions you can take is movement. So it gives you a good start. You may move a number of spaces on the map up to your speed. Your normal speed is two until you've upgraded it. Starts out fine. But then there's a bulleted list of everything you have to keep in mind as you are performing this move action. So right after, there are six restrictions to the movement action. Now, movement occurs only on triangular spaces between the map tiles. Your normal movement speed is equal to your speed tile and you start the game with a speed of two. And then you can upgrade your speed tile for three strength at the command post. You must move at least one space per turn. You may not end a turn on the same space that you began on. You may move through other places, but you may not stop on spaces that are occupied by other players. And lastly, you may move into numbered starting spaces. Woo! See, so like that information, what's hard about it is that that information is necessary. We need to know that but there has to be a better way to present that. And again, I'm not harking on any of these games or any of these rule books. I just want to address just some general concerns so we can all either understand it better or write it better or, you know what I mean. So this is fair, this is totally fair. Vindication is a more complicated game. It's definitely way more complex than others. All these restrictions are important and you have to know them. So you can't really shorten these if statements. So now the question is, how would you present it for people so it's easier to remember. Here, I would love to hear your thoughts on this, but 
here's what I was thinking and here's kind of what I propose. One, you can put bullets underneath, but I think his Vindication already did that. So kudos to them. However, you can also expand on this and I actually really liked what Skytier did. They put a section underneath theirs and put an often overlooked section, which I thought was very nice and kind of helped accentuate and distill down what was happening. So the first one, putting everything in a bullet list, Vindication already does that. There's only so much you can kind of distill down from there. The second thing I was thinking of is give a list of available options. I think Rising Sun does this really well. So here when they're talking about one of the actions, which is to recruit, they showed a mini and then a faded version of a mini and all these arrows pointing to different places. So using kind of like that faded miniature implies that here's an option of what could have happened. And I think that could have applied to Vindication. They did show one diagram here with their command post that addresses one of those bulleted points in the movement list. But I feel like they could have expanded on that and maybe include one diagram, but then it includes like different faded options or like different arrows pointing to six different options that adds to what they just described. For example, movement occurs on the triangular spaces between the hexagonal map tiles. They can just show that by showing one arrow to a triangular space. Another one, you must move at least one space per turn. It could be a player token that's not faded and then a faded player token at another spot with the arrows and then a greater than or equal to sign showing that. So I feel like these diagrams can distill down what was just written so it's easy for us to remember all the different options. You can do this, but not this. You can do this, but not this. Now to ensure that people teaching the game are teaching it properly and accurately and are also double checking to make sure that everything is performed to the T, I was thinking, what about a checklist? So I think it would be very helpful to expand on what Root did. In Root, they provided a two-turn example and it tells you exactly how the turn goes why you score certain points, what terms come into play at that particular point in time, and it even addresses how specific actions happen. I would just expand on this and include like a checklist for like all the movement options in Vindication. So after an example turn for movement, the checkbox can list, did you move at least one tile? Did you end your turn on a different space from where you started? Did you move into a starting space? Parentheses optional. Did you move through players? Parentheses allowed, but you can't end on a space with another player. Close parentheses. So not only does this help people ensure that they're performing these rules correctly, but it also helps people that are teaching the game, like me, to not miss a point. And it adds a further check to make sure that they are passing on valid and accurate information. Start off one pile and now we have 10,000 piles of books all across the table. Are you doing okay? So we talked about concepts and how they need to serve as the context or the basis or the premise for the next point that we're introducing, making sure that different parts of the rulebook are constantly referenced. We talked about chunking different parts of the rulebook so it's easier for us to remember information and of course to understand it since you're summarizing as you go. We talked about offering different solutions for the conditional if statements. Sounds like a stats class. And the last thing I want to mention is how the rulebook is going to end and then go over a lot of the nuances to address everyone's concerns and different points that people have brought up across social media. Now after the how to play part, it goes into victory conditions. So this just explained in explicit detail. I haven't seen many problems with victory conditions that have been explained in rulebooks. I think everyone, again, also does that very well. Following this, some manuals will list like different variants or different expansions to the game, which I think is a great spot to put here in the end. There's a big discrepancy in kind of this line down the middle between people who want just one rulebook or people that want rule books and reference books and how to play books, so books that are just differentiated into three different physical copies. I'm more of a one rule book type person. I'm like having multiple types of rule books, but that's, I feel like that's personal preference by that point. And then after victory conditions, have your index. Now the index should have a list of all the terms and where you can find them in the rule book. Pretty much most, if not all the spots where you can find them. So like if your game uses spell cards, then make sure you list every single part where spell cards are brought up. I think what would become very helpful here is if you have play testers, if they had to look up a specific term, all of that should be addressed in the index as well. And lastly, I want to bring up the points that were brought up across social media. So I asked everyone what frustrates them the most about Roblox or what they enjoy the most about Roblox or what they find satisfying and fulfilling from going through a rulebook. First off, please use bulleted points or bolded points liberally. You have to keep in mind that after you presented the game, some people want to go back to that game and they want to just quickly reference and get to the game. Using bold terms and bulleted points will help us get to that point much faster. Some rule books, like Archimedes, for instance, will include a one page reference guide. Actually, this is pretty much the entire rule book included in one page front and back, which I think is very nice for people that are returning to the game. So a lot of times rule books will include a player aid, which will make it much easier to understand. Don't repeat yourself unless it is absolutely necessary. 
Even use sidebars if you have to reiterate or highlight a specific point. Include as many pictures as possible. I know earlier we said the writing should be enough, but again, the writing should be enough and then the pictures will make it that much better. But when you do add pictures, add a lot. You do that to avoid flipping back and forth like, oh, what's this component again? Or what's that component again? If the component is already labeled right then and there next to the rule that it's being explained to in the beginning, at least it's going to save us a ton of time. Rule books have to include all rules because then how would we know it exists? That's a great point. I haven't personally experienced any of this yet, but supposedly in Marvel Champions, there are rules that have been omitted until you get to a specific part of the rulebook. Like when you're shuffling the hero deck or the encounter deck, the rules that are referenced there are not in the actual how to play. But instead of omitting, I think it'd be easier to just put like a sidebar or like a little asterisk saying, oh, by the way, remember this as you're playing. Again, a lot of mixed opinions about whether or not you should have one rulebook or multiple rulebooks. Root alone has three rulebooks. Like I see why and I understand why that they're broken down in this specific way to address the different audiences. But at the same time, they're also stating the same thing. So like, for example, here in the setup, uh, step two, set scores, place a score marker for each faction to play on zero on the score track. That's stated the same way in all three of these books. So to play devil's advocate, don't you think we can condense this all in one? But I would love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Do you prefer one rule book or do you prefer rule books and reference books and multiple books in general. So make sure like when you're using terms, there's no gray area for those terms. Like they are concrete terms. That way when people argue and they will, it's easier to define and see where the solution is depending on the terminology that you use. But the best way to figure this out, a ton of playtesters. Keep rules, strictly rules. Strategy does not belong in a rule book. I totally agree. This is just for us to understand how to play the game. I think strategy makes it that much more fun for us to understand. It's a totally different world. Terminology. There is a time and place for writing variety. Rule books, please don't include any kind of variety here. I think this is one area where it's totally fine to just use the same jargon. For example, don't refer to one as a hero card and the same thing later on as a helper tray and then one later on as a warrior board. But if they're all referencing the same thing, you would think that those are three different types of cards or components. Let's give a full recap from start to finish. All in all, how do you write a good board game rule book? Keep it simple. Start with a table of contents. Just tell us where everything is. Secondly, give us a component list with a picture identifying and labeling each and every one. Make sure you show the front and back of cards. Make sure you show the scale of the miniature. So a point where we can differentiate them easily as we pick them up from the tray. In your setup, just tell us what goes on the table, what goes in front of each player. In the intro, give a quick summary of what the game is about. Unless, of course, it is a story-driven campaign, then elaborate as needed. And then objective, what's the whole point of the game? What are we doing and how does the game end? Overview, here's where you establish time and where you establish order. How does time work in the game? Is it one round or is it five rounds? Tell us in an organized way how player actions are happening in an organized fashion. Tiny little snippet here. It's even better to include like conditional statements, make sure they're addressed here. So like, if this specific power is activated at this moment in time, make sure you put that in the right order. This also plays its part in the how to play section. And then speaking of the how to play section, make sure that as you are explaining this section, you are teaching players with the idea in mind that one concept is going to serve as context for the next. It is premising the next idea. So make sure your concepts have an anchor point and that everything related to that specific piece of information is also close by too. It helps out. So if you're talking about using one action, make sure you include everything related to that action close by. Reference page numbers throughout everything. If you're talking about a specific term, reference that page number. I think it's even better that you should include a checklist section. Make sure you are performing each action correctly and that you're explaining them correctly without forgetting any little nuances and it helps you remember them better as a teacher. Don't repeat yourself unless it is absolutely necessary. If anything, just use a sidebar to quickly highlight that information. Keep the terminology the same, keep it consistent. Action card is action card. Make sure it is written with as minimal objection as possible. So when people argue about the rules, which they will, there is a clear and concise solution to their argument. And then after the rules, you finish off with any kind of variant, any kind of expansion, totally fine to put that back there. And you finish off with an index that includes a page number for every single term that's listed and everywhere you can find them in the rule book. Woo! Now, I hope you enjoyed this amazing discussion, conversation that we've had. Again, I want to hear your thoughts and opinions. Just let me know down below. As I'm uploading this, I'm pretty sure I am as excited as I am filming this right now. Did you find this helpful? Are there any points of discussion that you want to talk about? Ideally, I just wanted this video to serve as some kind of basis for like future rule books. 
so we can all just enjoy more and more games. Again, I am not attacking any kind of rulebook whatsoever, but I just wanted to provide my thoughts and opinions in the perspective of someone who is teaching it all the time. And if you made it all the way here, thank you all so much for tuning in. Please consider subscribing if you aren't already to join this amazing photography, videography, board game journey that we've made here on this channel. All of my social media is right here and also linked down below. So if you wanna follow along with some more frequent updates and some interesting quick 24 hour daily Instagram video posts, things. But until then, have an amazing day and I can't wait to hear what you guys think.